One of the central features of Haskell is the use of lazy evaluation. We've seen that uh, we have something uh, very similar in a scheme, namely the force and delay primitives. They make it possible for evaluation to be lazy if we want to. But by contrast, Haskell uses lazy evaluation by default. What this means is that the argument of a function application, or, a, or an actual parameter if we will, is always evaluated at most once. That is only if we need it. And that's in contrast to call by value, also known as applicative order evaluation, where whenever we have an application um, of some function to some actual parameter, we must always evaluate the, the actual parameter E2 to a value before we can perform the beta reduction. Some functional programming languages use call by value instead of lazy evaluation. In particular, that's the case for the languages of the ML family, standard ML and OCaml and F sharp all use call by value. Well, what is lazy evaluation? Lazy evaluation rests on a specific version of uh, the semantics of the lambda calculus in which there is only one rule for application one that says that if we have an ap application, E1, E2, then uh, this can only reduce if E1 reduces. So this will ensure that E1 will reduce all the way down to an abstraction, uh, if possible. And this is also what we know as normal order evaluation. Uh, and then, of course, we still have beta reduction, beta reduction saying that whenever we have uh, an application where the applicant is uh, a lambda abstraction, then we can uh, substitute the actual parameter e2, the argument, into the body of e1. So it's, this, it's the use of these two rules that makes sure that we have a uh, lazy evaluation as a parameter passing mechanism. We don't have two app rules, only one. And this is in fact call by name because call by name, as you may remember, uh, tells us that the actual parameter, in this case that's E2, uh, gets substituted for the formal parameter throughout the body of the function. Um, what about uh, the expressive power of lazy evaluation? Well, as it turns out, lazy evaluation is m much more powerful than uh, call by value. Here's a simple example to show you why. Consider a tiny, tiny Haskell program. Uh, it's got the declaration of a function blah, blah of x is defined to be blah of x. And we've got another function h, h of set is 7. Uh, and now you might wonder what's the value of h if we apply it to blah of 8. Let's find out. Let's load it into Haskell. And what happens if we call h the blah of 8? We get 7, which is perhaps surprising because blah of h is not uh, a well-defined value. But because we've got a lazy evaluation, we never need to evaluate blah of h. So there is no problem here. If, on the other hand, we decided that we would uh, we would uh, redefine h of z to be 7 plus z, then uh, if we now try to evaluate h of blah of 8, uh, we're stuck because uh, blah of h does not evaluate uh, to evaluate. And we now need to find the value of the parameter. One of the very nice and compelling features of lazy evaluation is that it makes it possible for us to define infinite data structures in Haskell. To see why this is the case, remember that a list is really written using successive applications of the cons constructor, this little fellow. So if we write the list of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It's really just a shorthand for 1, constant to 2, constant to 3, constant to 4, constant to 5. That's then constant onto the, the empty list. Uh, 
so this means that we can define infinite lists and get a result if we only use finite parts of it. For instance, we can define an infinite list of ones. The list ones is one const onto ones. If we remember the terminology from scheme, what we're really defining here is a stream. And since we're assuming a lazy evaluation, uh, whenever we only need a finite part of an infinite structure, we can find that uh, using lazy evaluation because we only evaluate as much as we need. Um, there's a function in Haskell in the standard prelude called take. Uh, take uh, is a function of type int to a list to a list, uh, which satisfies that if we call take with n and l, it'll return the first elements of the list l. So we might ask, what is take 5? of ones. Let's find out. Now suppose that we have uh, introduced the definition of the stream ones. We have it here. Let's save the file, load it into Haskell. Can we then take the sublist consisting of the first five elements of one? Yes, indeed we get one 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 one. That's what we wanted. So that's Fine, lazy evaluation to the rescue. And why does this work? Well, it works because we only need to evaluate the first five elements of the infinite list. That's all we need. We only need to evaluate a finite part of the infinite structure. And that's where lazy evaluation comes into play. Now, um, there's something else that's really quite convenient. It may not seem as deep, but uh, in a little while we'll see why this is nice. Uh, there's something called ranges in Haskell. Uh, if we want to specify a list, sometimes we can specify the list by just writing its endpoints. That's provided that the elements of the list are from an, an enumeration type. Uh, two enumeration types in Haskell that are well known, or should be well known, are int and char. So if we want to write uh, the list of uh, integers from 1 up to 14, all we need to do is write 1 dot dot 14 in brackets. But that's more, because we can write infinite lists. If we want a list of all the natural numbers, all we need to do is write 1 dot dot in brackets. So that's a very short way of representing the list of natural numbers in Haskell. And Ranges uh, are particularly useful when we speak of what's known as list comprehension. List comprehension is the Haskell version of something that we know from set theory, namely set comprehension. And it's one of the nice features of set theory, which is that we can use abstraction to define sets. For instance, if we want to define the set of even natural numbers, we can do this by writing um, the set of natural numbers which satisfy this condition, namely that there exists an i in n such that n is 2i. And we can do something very similar in Haskell. Um, if we want to define the list of even natural numbers, we can write it in this way. And notice how similar it is to set comprehension. It's really more or less the same thing. Um, the condition here is called a generator. It's analogous to the condition here in the set abstraction. This is a condition that tells us which universe to take the ends from. And here we say that the i is taken from here, from the infinite list, from this infinite range. So this is called a generator, what we've got here. This specifies the universe from which the, uh, the elements of the list must be taken. Well, we can also define the list of even numbers that are also divisible by 7. And this list of even 7s is defined as the list of elements uh, that are of the form 2 times i, where i is taken from this universe. So this is our generator, but where 2 times i modulo 7 is equal to naught. 
This is not a generator, this is a condition that must be satisfied. And this condition is called a guard. And guards are truth-valued conditions. So we can use uh, generators and we can use guards to define list comprehensions. And that can be really, really powerful because we can write things very nicely and very in a very short manner by using well, list comprehension is, in some sense, just syntactic sugar. It's just filtering applied to ranges. Can you see how? Think about it for a moment before you continue. So here is an alternative definition and one that will bring out the fact that uh, list comprehension is really just uh, a combination of ranges and filtering. So let's define even sevens prime. And let's see, what should that be? Well, first we find uh, the universe, which is the natural numbers, and we map the doubling function onto that, lambda i, 2 times i, so if we do that, we get the list of even numbers. So notice that this corresponds to applying a generator. We map the generator function onto the range. And then we filter, because that's applying a guard. So we filter uh, the function lambda x x mod 7 equals to naught. We filter that onto this list and that's our even sevens. Yeah. So now let's Find the first five elements of even sevens prime. What do we get? We get the same list as before. This was the list we thought we got um, 